Well, you exclude false tests, that actually standing up in the clinic is a more specific test than actually going through this tilt table test. Let me show you a little example of, uh, of what these tilt table tests look like. This is a graph here. Let me explain it to you. In this situation, you've got a tilt test involving pure autonomic failure. Now, remember, your autonomic uh, nervous system is controlling your blood pressure and your heart rate. And in this situation, what you have is that as the blood pressure drops, the normal response is the heart rate should go up. Well, it does, but not very significant. In this situation, you've got someone who has a form of dysautonomia where they have extensive autonomic failure. Now, you also have what referred to as neurally mediated syncope, big fancy term, means you faint. What happens in that, in this situation, you find is that as the blood pressure drops, again, the normal response is the heart rate should go up. But because of vagal stimulation, acetylcholine, that's another one of those neurotransmitters we talked about, as the blood pressure drops, Conversely, instead of going up, the heart rate actually begins to go down. This is another form of dysautonomia. Now in POTS, which is the main thing that we're talking about during this period of time, but you find that the blood pressure stays relatively stable, but notice, look at the heart rate, it goes up. So their, their heart rate is going up even though their blood pressure doesn't change. So by doing this tilt table test or even having them stand up in the clinic and noticing that their heart rate goes up, but the blood pressure is not changing, that makes us highly suspicious for this diagnosis of POTS. Now, there's some other tests that they mention here, and in some centers they do this, and that is, for example, because norepinephrine is one of the neurotransmitters that's released at the end of these nerves, uh, they can measure these norepinephrine levels uh, while the, the patient is supine, lying down for about 15 minutes, and they draw blood, then they have them stand for about 15 minutes and they draw blood. This is very significant for what is referred to as hyperadrenergic pox, but it's another one of the confirmatory tests. But it's interesting about this diagram by these authors. The dotted line is saying that these are helpful, but they're not required. It's a history, checking the blood pressure, and maybe doing a tilt test uh, that is really helpful in terms of making the diagnosis of POTS. Now, what do you do about it? Now, there's more on this slide than we possibly could go over, and I'm not going to go over all of it. But what I, what I would say here is that you can see there are non-pharmacologic, not, not everything in medicine requires a pill. And I realize that some people think that, but not everything in medicine requires a pill. There are all kinds of non-pharmacologic methods that we do to try to address this because one pill that may help one patient, for another patient, it actually makes their uh, symptoms worse. So issues of diet, for example, because the autonomic nervous system, normally when you eat, there's a change in blood flow to the intestinal tract in order to accomplish uh, digestion. Well, that change in blood flow may be just enough to throw the person with these into symptoms. And so it's important that they eat smaller, uh, let, uh, more frequent meals instead of this going out and having the big pig out that some of us are guilty of, okay? It's important because volume is related to that, that they have adequate fluid intake. So often they're advised to take anywhere between two to three liters a day. That's a lot of water. As a general rule of thumb, you say, how much water should I take? Well, there's a general rule of thumb. Uh, we're all adults here, and I'm a doctor, so I won't talk like a doctor. I always tell patients this way. If you go to the bathroom and your urine has any color in it, you're not taking enough water. Okay? So when you go and it's clear, that's when you know you're taking enough. All right? Excluding the one when you get up first thing in the morning. Okay? So they need to be taking lots of water. The other thing that's part of maintaining that volume is also salt intake. Now, all of your lives, you've always said, cut back on salt, cut back on salt, cut back on salt. But in this situation, they need the extra salt for a couple of reasons. First of all, we know that there is a disturbance of what's called the renin angiotensin system. Now, for some of you, that means nothing. But that's the way the kidneys regulate salt and potassium, sodium and potassium in the blood. So they recognize that they need extra salt because they end up wasting salt. Uh, there is a rule for moderate exercise several days a week. And you say, wait a minute, they have symptoms with it. Well, again, everything has to be in balance. The whole point of the exercise is to restore that sense of homeostasis. When a person is active and moving those muscles, they're constricting their lower extremities, and if there's any pooling of blood, they're actually pushing blood back into the active circulation. There are other things there, but I see my time is quickly disappearing, so I'm going to move on. Remember this, the first dictum of medicine, do no harm. And this is one of the reasons why in a primary care setting, and I'm trained as a family doctor, if you don't recognize this, 
your patients can actually be worse because so many of these medications act on those neurotransmitters at the end of those nerves. So what you think you're doing to help the patient, they feel worse and they don't like you very much. The other thing I think is important in management is don't forget the whole person. One of the most important components of managing POTS and often the most neglected are the significant disruptions that occur in a patient's personal and social life that result in occupational, psychological, marital, legal, and financial problems. Even though many physicians are uncomfortable with helping patients deal with these issues, these are often the areas that, they have, that have the greatest impact on the lives of people with dysautonomia and POTS and the lives of their families. The physician should be prepared to assist by helping them gain access to social workers, occupational therapy, psychological, and legal counseling. And in addressing the whole person uh, in the patient, I also personally want to add the importance of addressing the spiritual nature. Now, I know there are many doctors who don't talk about that particular aspect of the individuals, and they feel very uncomfortable addressing this. However, there is a significant body of medical literature that shows, that demonstrates that most patients actually want their health care provider to speak to them about spiritual matters, matters as long as the health care healthcare provider does it with permission, with sensitivity, and respect for the patient. Faith is a powerful facilitator of hope for people who are experiencing chronic debilitating diseases. Summary points. One. Most patients related in, as it relates to dysautonomia are misdiagnosed. It, there is an interesting quote, 83% of the patients are misdiagnosed with a psychiatric condition prior to a more accurate diagnosis involving the autonomic nervous system. And on average, the patient who is suffering from this condition must wait six years before a proper diagnosis is found. Now there are many factors that contribute to that misdiagnosis. One, there is the pressure and time constraints on healthcare providers to assess and diagnose patients' problems very, very quickly. One of the places that I work locally is an urgent care center. I actually have people at a corporate headquarters checking up on me if I don't have people in and out from the time they walk in the door to the time they walk out within 45 minutes. You can't figure this out in 45 minutes. Usually it requires multiple visits and a long conversation to really see what all the symptoms that the individual is having. So even though I recognize that doctors are missing this diagnosis, I also understand the basis for it because of the pressures that are on them in which they are working. Furthermore, there is a lack of provider training about dysautonomia. You know, on a personal note, it was a patient here at Indiana Western University who introduced me to the diagnosis of POTS. I knew a little bit about the autonomic nervous system after all I went to medical school, but I never made the connection of this syndrome with the way people were suffering until that patient came to me many, 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 many times and I scratched my head and I can't figure out what's wrong with them. And then she went off to Big Fancy Plus the Mayo Clinic and came back and told me what she had. It made sense to me. So one of the first things I want to do is say, thank you, Kaylee. Another summary point. The assessment of the autonomic nervous system dis, uh, disorders or dysautonomia is dependent upon key symptoms and physical signs. Now those key signs and symptoms are difficulty with standing, fatigue, lightheadedness, nausea, and other GI symptoms, brain fog, palpitations. Those are all things that you can find simply by asking the right questions or doing that review of systems. And also learning to check the patient's orthostatic vital signs. When they're lying, they're sitting, and they're standing, looking for signs will point towards symptoms, signs and symptoms associated with this autonomy. Another summary point, a meaningful diagnosis improves patient's outcomes. We all understand, regardless of what your medical problem is, if, if you don't have a right diagnosis, you get through all kinds of medicine and treatment at it, and you may actually be doing more harm than good. So there is a wide spectrum of symptomatology associated with this autonomy and the disability associated with it. Mild and transient presentations can often be treated with just supportive care. But if symptoms are persistent, complex, debilitating, it may be necessary to, one, spend more time with the patient. That's hard to do when you're in a busy medical practice. Spend more time with the patient, really listen to them. 
It's also important when you suspect this to be careful about referral to other specialists. And our, I'll make an editorial comment here, in our fragmented system of American medical care, we send you to every specialist. You've got something wrong with your heart, you go to the cardiologist. There's something wrong with your stomach, go to the gastroenterologist. And then, they, like, I remember medical school says, if you don't specialize in the retina of the right eye, I can't help you, okay? Well, it's because of our fragmented medical care, which has many positive things. I don't want to sound completely derogatory, but looking at the big picture is essential in order to help these individuals with the nature of dysautonomia and the symptoms that they're experiencing. Understanding the intricacies and complexities of dysautonomia enables the clinician to tailor their treatment specifically to that patient's problems. Treatment requires patience and perseverance. It's not one size fits all. You don't look up in the book, diagnosis, pill, here's your script. It has to be individually tailored based on the challenges that that particular patient is experiencing. And also, finally here, when caring for these patients, you must remember the whole person approach that involves the physical, the psychological, social, and spiritual dimensions of all that there is going on. Although there is no known cause for primary or idiopathic dysautonomia, if you find secondary causes, such as diabetes or other things like this, and we do know that you treat those, those other diseases effectively, the dysautonomia symptoms do improve. Consider co coexisting conditions and change only one variable at a time. Because the autonomic nervous system has so many things going on, if you throw a whole bunch of pills and medicines at these people simultaneously, they come back feeling a whole lot worse, and then as the doctor or physician, you're saying, wait a minute, well, I don't know which one I'm supposed to take away. Which one is the one that was the problem? So it's very important to, if you're prescribing medication, that uh, another dictum that I was taught that I believe in very much is you should always start low and go slow and see regular follow-up with that particular patient to see how they're responding. Thank you. My name is Kaylee Sills. I'm a senior here at Indiana Wesleyan University, about to graduate in 26 days. <laughs> um, I'm also the assistant director of the Dysautonomy Advocacy Foundation. Um, that, and so we have partnered uh, together with the college to uh, bring this tonight. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the patient perspective. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit about my story and about why um, talking about this is important. So January 1st, 2014 was the very first day I went into the ER with horrendous abdominal pain and I, you know, they, they looked me over up and down and they ran a test. They said, well, you don't have appendicitis, you know, there's nothing seriously wrong with you, you know, go home, follow up with your doctor. So I went home. Um, it didn't improve and so... Um, about a week later, I went to an urgent care facility here in Marion, and uh, lo and behold, Dr. Philip Renfro was there. Now, I had not met him before. This was my first encounter with him. Um, he doesn't work at MedExpress very often, but he just happened to be working this day. And so I explained to him what was going on, and um, we, we really couldn't reach a, a firm conclusion. And uh, we suggested, you know, maybe going back to the ER, which I didn't, didn't want to do. Again. Um, and so at my wit's end, I came here to the, to the school health clinic, not realizing that he was now one of our school physicians. <laughs> and uh, so talking with the nurse, and she's like, oh yes, we have this great missionary doctor here um, now at IWU. His name's Dr. Philip Renfro. You should go see him. And I said, wait, what? <laughs> so um, that's how Dr. Renfro and I met. And so January, February, March, April went by. We tried medication after medication, um, you know, very slowly and methodically. But by the end of the time, um, by the time I finally got a diagnosis, these were all the bottles that I had of stuff that we had tried that just didn't work. Um, we had discussed um, possibly doing, you know, a HIDA scan because I had done an ultrasound in my gallbladder and. You know, I had no stones, 
Um, and I'm obviously, you know, too young for my gallbladder just to completely just stop working. And uh, so finally in May, we were, front, we were like, fine. This is the last thing really that we can think to do right now. And so 40%, if, if your gallbladder is only functioning 40%, it's considered not functioning. Mine was only working 7%. Usually when your gallbladder is not working, they get you in, they get it out within a couple days. I had just went five months while in school, in class, having gallbladder attacks every day, every other day at least, um, trying to go through school. Um, and in June 12th, 2014, they finally removed it. Um, by the time they removed it, I had lost 30 pounds in a matter of a few months. Uh, there's a picture of Dr. Renfro and I when we when we first started meeting together. I had gotten him a new bow tie for his collection. Um, but by the grace of God, I made it through the semester. And after having it out, I felt so much better. Uh, that summer, I thought, okay, this is finally over. You know, I, that's what that was what was wrong, and you know, I can just get back to my life. Well. In October and really the beginning of school in September, I started noticing symptoms again. I started noticing more GI symptoms. Um, I started noticing that my memory just wasn't as good as it used to be, and, and all of a sudden, like I would just lose my train of thought, and then I couldn't think of the word that I wanted, and then, you know, it it makes it difficult when you're in the middle of a test, and then just everything's just gone. And um, so just very slowly, you know, I started noticing all these symptoms coming back again. Really November and December, things really started to get bad. And that's kind of when I first started noticing that I was starting to have cardiac symptoms. Because before, I was focusing on my GI symptoms. Pretty much everything else just took a back seat. And that, that was what the symptoms I was focused on. And then I, I started to think, yeah, you know, I, I've really been having palpitations when I walk up the stairs and I've really been short of breath and you know I'm thinking okay I'm in college I'm in nursing school I don't have time to exercise I'm just you know you know out of shape and I just need to exercise more so I started just kind of bringing up these symptoms you know like well you know I have been noticing these cardiac symptoms more I've been noticing you know I'm being short of breath and and everything and uh, so we we did a couple uh, Holter monitor tests, um, had a Holter monitor for a few days, um, and then in January and February had a few cardiac appointments. Uh, the cardiologist printed off my Holter monitor results, and they were about this thick. They were about a, probably two inches thick. And he's flipping through them in the patient room, and he looks at me and he goes, how on earth are you still in school? No explanation yet of what was going on um, and I just kind of shrugged and I, I said well my my dad didn't give me an ultimatum so <laughs> so uh, uh, we after talking with the cardiologist the cardiologist was like well I really don't know what's wrong but you have you know your, your heart rate is all over the place you've got multiple different kinds of heart rhythms going on here um, you know, I really think we should we should do an ablation. So we thought about it, and we we had it scheduled. And um, then in about um, March, uh, things just really just things were just progressively getting worse. I was I was having a hard time functioning at all. And in March, I ended up spending a week in the hospital. And we were just really just exacerbated. We just we didn't know what to do. We weren't getting any answers. We had went to like everybody in the state you could possibly go to, and nobody had an idea of what was wrong. And so like we had we had put in like referrals to you know all the big places like Vanderbilt and Mayo, and uh, still hadn't heard back. A week after I got out of the hospital. Mayo called and they said we've got an opening uh, they called on a like on a Tuesday or Wednesday and said we've got an opening next Tuesday like within a week if you could be down here in Jacksonville 
And so my mom and I packed up the car and we drove to Jacksonville. And initially we only had like one or two appointments scheduled because um, that was all that was open. But um, they said, well, what you can do is you can be in their, in their doctor's office at 6.30 in the morning and you can wait in their waiting room all day in hopes of somebody not showing up for their appointment. So that is exactly what we did. We got up at 6.30 in the morning and in five days we saw seven physicians. We had two tests and an entire slew of blood work done within five days. It was an absolute miracle from God that that even happened, that he opened the door and that we were able to get in within five days because it is a really long drive to have to make that trip twice. It took them 10 minutes to diagnose POTS. And my initial question was, well, I don't pass out. So like, how, how, do, how do I have POTS? Because I was under the misconception that all patients with POTS uh, pass out. And they said, no, no, no. They said that is only about 40% of patients with POTS actually pass, pass out. It's, it's a lot more about, it's about the heart rate and then some of them do deal with um, the issue with passing out. So we came back with a diagnosis. They, you know, told us, you know, gave us some like standard treatment options, some medications. Um, we tried all of them. None of them ended up working. Um, by the time I got a diagnosis, it was a year and three months later. I was I was actually very lucky to have gotten a diagnosis in that long because, like he said, the average time is six years. Um, by then, I lost 50 pounds, um, and I I did actually make it through my year of school that year by the grace of God yet again. Um, about April. Um, I decided that I was going to do, I was going to start doing more research and I was going to learn this for myself. Because as a nursing student, I should know everything about what it is that I've got. Um, and I had, I had uh, watched um, Christina's funeral online in March. Um, Tava will talk about that um, in the next session. And uh, it just really touched me, and I thought, you know, I, well, I need to do something as a nursing student to give back to this population. So in April 2015, I contacted the Dysautonomy Advocacy Foundation. I contacted multiple foundations, but they were the only one that messaged me back. And I just said, you know, hey, I'm going to be doing research. You know, is there is there any kind of research that you need? And so Ainsley. Our founding director uh, messaged me back and then she said, yes, absolutely. She said, what would you like to do? And I said, well, you know, I, I really don't know. And I, I just said, you know, I just, I want to help. I'm going to be on summer break. And uh, so she gave me a list. And so I started creating educational graphics, talking with patients, answering questions, monitoring our social media. Um, I launched our Instagram, but most of all I started learning. I started reading uh, research articles and scholarly journals and more research articles and more scholarly journals and really delving into what is dysautonomy as a whole, not just POTS, but all of the different forms. And like how rare actually is this? Because I'd actually went to high school with another, with one of my great friends who also has POTS. And so I'm thinking, this is a really weird coincidence that this thing that's supposedly rare has now happened to two of us in a very small school of 120 K through 12. It was about this time that Kelly Friedman from the Dysautonomia Project contacted me and she said, hey, would you like to write a book? And I said, me? I said, you, you do realize there's nothing fancy after my name. I have no MDs, PhDs. I don't even have a bachelorette, yet, baccalaureate degree yet. Um, and she said, no, that's all right. She said, don't worry. You know, we have like 52 physicians and people with their master's degrees that will be editing your work before we publish it. From all, you know, professionals from all over the country. It's like, that makes me feel a lot better. Um, so um, I did help help her over the summer. I actually wrote two chapters in this book, and we had it published on October fourth. Um, I flew down to 
Tampa and we had a, a Grand Round CME on dysautonomia and we had a gala in, in honor of the publishing. And so that was just a really neat experience. Um, that book, we have copies here tonight. Uh, the Dysautonomia Project has donated these books to us and any donation, you can pick up one of these books. The donations, all that money is going to funding uh, having this seminar here tonight and going to um, Tava's flight up, who she's graciously flown up from Tampa to be with us tonight. It's also going to research. It's going to the foundation. Um, if for some reason you cannot get one tonight, um, we have a code. It's IWU, all caps. Um, if you go to the Dysautonomia Project website and punch in that code, you'll get a discount. Uh, but right out through those doors, we have the books here. We have a, a wonderful student who have uh, donated their time to, to uh, help collect those. So why are we having this seminar here today? There is an estimated 70 million people worldwide with dysautonomia. That's autonomic nervous system dysfunction. There's a whole lot of things that fall under dysautonomia. Um, you know, one thing that makes it easier is when we compare these things to things we're familiar with. Parkinson's disease, most all of us have heard of Parkinson's disease. You know, maybe even we've had friends or loved ones that uh, have been afflicted with this disease. There are roughly 10 million worldwide with Parkinson's disease. You are seven times more likely to run into somebody with dysautonomia than you are with someone with Parkinson's disease. Another statistic, just trying to compare to kind of get an idea. Um, it's estimated that a half million plus, uh, some statistics go clear up to three million people in the U.S. have POTS. Um, 1.25 million have type 1 diabetes. The most staggering statistic I have found comes from Mayo Clinic, and that is 1 in 100 teenagers are estimated to have POTS. 1 in 100. I could get into why the half a million does not reflect the 1 in 100 and get into the, all the epidemiology, but that would be an entirely another seminar. 25% of patients with POTS are unable to work or attend school. And so, being an assistant director of a foundation where I have instant access to over 20,000 people um, in our foundation, I ask them, you know, what do you want to see? Like, what, what would be most helpful for you? And, and almost, you know, unanimously, yes, they wanted to be, have education, but they wanted their friends and their family members to understand what it was like to be them. They wanted, you know, to be able to educate their friends and family so that they could help them. And so we created this graphic. This graphic um, comes from a quote from Dr. Blair Grubb and um, several others who have also quoted this, that doctors compare dysautonomia to simultaneously having COPD and congestive heart failure. This graphic was shared over a thousand times and over 140,000 people saw this graphic. And so that kind of gave us a clue that, wow, people just really want to be understood. These, these people want to feel validated. Um, this graphic also brings up um, a quote that I actually heard recently, um, a study that I read, and that the quality of life for these patients is compared to having chronic kidney failure and needing dialysis every week. <coughs> so I asked the question, I said, what is the hardest thing that you've heard while you, since you've gotten sick? Because you want people to understand what's going on and, you know, these patients, dysautonomia, is confusing, it's hard to understand. Um, and so I posed the question and I said, what's the hardest thing that, you know, <clears throat> you've heard since you became ill? And I got over 150 responses to this question. 
And so I picked out just a few. Um, the top one, just to make a comment, I'm gonna let you read some of these since I don't have them on my screen. But it's not cancer. There are people who are a lot worse off. At least you're not dying. One of the patients wrote on there that her physician actually told her and she quoted that the physician said, you know, you're not dying, but there are times that you will want to. And there are times that you are gonna feel like you are. And just in my experience, there have been times where you, you, that is exactly how you feel. Um, just the constellation of symptoms when so, there's something wrong in almost every body system that this autonomic nervous system is controlling. There's just a whole lot going on. So jumping down, um, there's a lot of if you would just do this, if you would just get more sleep, if you would just eat better, if you would just drink more water, you know, if you would just exercise more, you know, if you didn't, you know, maybe if you didn't drink as much caffeine, you would just feel better. And there's a lot of you know, telling patients, you know, well, you know, maybe if you had just done this, um, I can guarantee you that patients do everything humanly possible to help themselves feel better. And managing this condition, I, is extremely hard. When you're trying to manage and juggle multiple body systems, physicians have a hard time doing it, let alone patients. In closing, being at a college, uh, one, one question has come up, and um, I know that there are other uh, college students here that have uh, dysautonomia. And I've been asked the question, how will, you, how will you ever be a nurse? And I went into nursing to make people's lives better. I wanted to help people. I wanted to be there in their time of need, be there in their time of pain. I just wanted to alleviate it, even, even if just a little bit. And God said, okay, if you want to help people, you need to be able to understand them. You need to be able to understand what it's like to be them. You need to understand what it's like to be in pain, to not have a diagnosis, to not have all the answers, to be scared. You need to know what it's like to be misunderstood. You're gonna to have to come to the end of yourself, the bottom of the barrel, the edge of the cliff. And that's when I can step in and take you further than you ever thought you could go, help you do more than you ever thought you could and the strength that you don't have. Because that's when God gets the glory for the things that are done. When you trust him with everything that you have left just to make it through another day. And society tells us that we are only one person and one person can't make a difference. But one person can. It doesn't matter if you're ill and it doesn't matter if you're healthy. It doesn't matter if you're in that 25% that's homebound. Your life has purpose and meaning, and you can be used for the greater good no matter where you're at today. And so my response to this question is that I already am. We are going to take a 10-minute break, and when we come back... All right, good afternoon. My name is Taylor Wilson Tornant, and I'm the mother of Christina Tornant, who you see up on the screen. Um, before I get started, I want to thank Kaylee, especially for organizing this, and the Dysautonomia Advocacy Foundation for inviting me to be here today. So, uh, my daughter Christina died actually 13 months ago today, and you're probably wondering why I am here. I'm here to stress the urgency regarding the lack of awareness that exists among medical professionals about dysautonomia and other commonly un underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed disorders that often accompany dysautonomia, such as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which I now know Christina also had. So I'm hopeful that all of you, before you leave today, 
will understand that if you're living for years with seemingly unlinked symptoms, and those in the medical field that you're seeing are not giving you any answers or providing you with any kind of diagnosis or any hope that you might sometime get better, but, but literally no diagnosis at all, it's very frustrating and it causes you to steadily become more and more hopeless. So I'm not at all here to blame the medical professionals because honestly, they can't diagnose what they don't know. And dysautonomia is not something taught in med school at this point. But my, my goal now is to make sure that it is something taught in every medical pro school program and so that everyone leaves their residency knowing the classic signs and symptoms and more specifically, like what Dr. Renfro discussed, touched on how to diagnose it, and it's quite simple, actually, as, um, as is the other syndrome Christina suffered from. So hopefully, uh, within the next few years, everyone will be trained, and we can move forward with people not having to suffer for six years before they're diagnosed, or in our case, probably more than that. So uh, Christina was an old soul, as I say up here, who exuded joy and embraced life from the beginning. She did have a really positive impact on people from an early age. Um, but regarding her old soul, her elder brother would often say, Christina, are you gonna be 80 or 85 today? <laughs> because she'd be like four years old making these profound statements. And it was really quite something. So as I looked back through her baby book, <clears throat> I noticed things like she started walking when she was nine months old, she was running when she was 10 months old, so she was super physically active. And a month before her second birthday, and I think this just kind of personifies who Christina was, I wrote this in her book, and when I came across it, I bawled hysterically, it was after she died. You make other people feel special, like they matter to and are important to you. This is a special gift. Truly, everyone you meet loves you because of your smiley, winning way. You are such a ray of sunshine. And that really exemplifies what I've heard from people since she died, from MIT, from Florida, from people I, I didn't even know who had met her, but I didn't know about them, that have emailed me, texted me. She would just walk into a place and it would be like a ray of sunshine. And interestingly, the picture in the upper right-hand corner there was taken on the one-year anniversary of her death. There was a series of about 10 pictures taken. A bunch of her friends went to the beach that day. Every single one of them had a ray of light in it. And they were taken from all different angles. There was not a photographer. They were all different phones. And they all had a ray of light. So the kids started texting him to me. I wasn't there. And I was like, guys, are you seeing she's there with you? And then, you know, of course, they all started going, oh my gosh. Yes, Christina is here with us. And so it was, uh, yeah a really amazing moment for us. So just to kind of go through Christina's life, because some of it does relate to her illness. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be able to get through like all the awards, academic, I mean, athletically, that she won and everything she accomplished. She was just a very gifted athlete. Um, I've listed a few here, but the really important thing about Christina is what her coaches repeated over the years, and I just heard it over and over from every coach she had. They'd say, more important than her athletic talent is her drive, determination, her work ethic, and her heart. They'd say she has so much determination. They said, I, basically, I've never seen this in an athlete before, and she was competing at very high levels. So these people had witnessed high-level athletes before. So that's what differentiated her. So academically, you know, she did everything she it was everything became easy to her especially math she loved math and won all kinds of awards that you know would have taken the rest of the powerpoint to put up and so we're not going to even get into that but she did get into her dream school which is MIT she was very excited about that and um, very determined to make that dream a reality so at this point of her life well not at this point not at the point where she got into MIT, but anyway. In, in Christina's life, here's just an example of who she was. This was an active kid. She traveled all over. She loved to ski and surf and wake skate and play beach, volleyball, whatever. But the thing that was interesting about Christina was the joy and intensity with which she did it, with which she did everything. She'd be out on the tennis court just goofing around, 
but there would be just like, you should just exude this joy. And so she taught me things like every day and she still teaches me things every day, which is kind of amazing. So starting in on her medical history, from the time she was tiny, as soon as she'd get sick, even a little bit, her fevers would spike at a minimum of 103.5. And I hadn't seen that at all in my son, so we thought that was kind of strange. Gastrointestinal problems. Her belly was always distended. I mean, from the get-go, she'd get back, she'd get in the car from gymnastics practice when she was like five. After a three-hour practice, there, she would be, gas would be leaving her body for like, three minutes straight. I mean, and she said, Mom, I'm letting it go in there too. But she just, yeah, super distended. Um, we tried every diet because we started seeing doctors, especially um, gastroenterologists from the beginning. No, no diet helped her. Not omitting milk, not omitting wheat, not omitting gluten, nothing. So then we realized in her childhood years that she didn't perspire. The only place she perspired from was were her hands but nowhere else in her body, so she had really no way to regulate her temperature. We did not realize at that time that this was a malfunctioning of her autonomic ner nervous system. Um, we started noticing she had a lot of joint pains more than most athletes. She had uh, often uh, have her knees and ankles taped, especially her ankles taped in competitions. And then um, she subsequently had uh, b benign t tumors removed from her femur and her patella. And then, you know, these are now things that I now realize. Um, when she was a little baby, she, started, she would walk like, or through to toddler years, she would roll her toes under and walk around, like literally her toes extended under her, just run around the house like that. Um, she could hyperextend her elbows, scapula, shoulders, fingers, we called her bendy fingers, her fingers would just go all over the place. And the reason I'm describing all of this to you is because um, these are all symptoms of something, a couple of forms of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which I'm pointing out because there does seem to be a link between Ehlers-Danlos, which is a collagen-based genetic mutation, so something she would have been born with, and then patients later developing dysautonomia, meaning that possibly early diagnosis of EDS could lead to ways to avoid or lessen the severity of the dysautonomia. There are definitely things we would have done differently had this, the EDS been diagnosed. Um, so that was kind of why I pointed that out. As Christina grew, her symptoms got worse right around the time she started getting her period, which was around ages 14 or 15. She really didn't get many periods in her short life, but um, that is an example of just how she her belly was unless she held it in and uh, it's kind of that makes it look a lot less bad than it actually was i mean her it would just stick out it would be from the minute she drank a sip of water she would just it would just all um, just start distending um what i've listed up there is just kind of a sampling of some of the doctors we saw and i just thought it was really interesting when these the other two presenters talked about looking at the whole person and um, no one ever did that. And in fact, within one gastroenterology practice, we saw three doctors and four nurse practitioners, and every time we had to tell our entire story. And this is over a period of a couple of years. But there was never a person like Dr. Renfro that was actually interested in trying to help us along the way. Not one person. And I'm still, I still can't believe this today. So, um, yeah, so these are some of the things that started happening. There was a kinesiologist, so we said, you know, we'll go into maybe a different area. This is not a typical doctor. And he said, this sounds like a malfunctioning of the autonomic nervous system. And he started explaining this to me, and I said, okay, I'm going to take this back to all the other doctors, and maybe this will give them a clue of a direction to go. So I did, and not one of them had anything to say about it at all. None of the specialists. They literally just ignored that completely. So things went from bad to worse in October of 2013 when Christina got mono. At this point, she became horribly sick. Her, her spleen was enlarged, and her health was never fully restored from that point on. And new symptoms began emerging, and I've listed some of them. Eye tremors, ringing in the ears, numbness in the extremities, 
um, to the point sometimes where she couldn't walk because she had no feeling whatsoever in her feet. Uh, lower back and hip pain, digestive problems, got worse and worse, but the symptoms were up and down. So like one day she could hold the pen and write and do what she needed to do it in class, and the next day she couldn't. And people at school, you know, she was very well liked amongst her peers, but her friends were dropping like flies because A, she has no social life, she's not well enough to go out. Every night she's at home, either studying, well, and she was a swimmer, she was an athlete. And so, and it, you know, that's another thing I feel that because she was horizontal while swimming and lack of gravity, swimming was probably the, a sport that she was able to do and she kept doing it and she's, she's the kind of person that would push through ridiculous amounts of discomfort and pain. So, um, so all these new symptoms come, um, I'm talking to the doctors about these in the next few months and where we are, and she's so weak at this point, she can't really even explain what's going on. So they're going, well, Christina, what's wrong? Not mom, Christina. And so they don't want to hear it from me, they want to hear it from her. She's 17, or actually 16 years old at this point, and she's, she can, she's so weak, it's hard for her to speak. And they don't want to listen to me. Okay, so, so I'm, I guess, the crazy mom. Um, her symptoms, um, basically just continue to escalate. And, and again, what I got from them over and over and over again is, she getting, she's getting straight A's, she's gonna be the valedictorian of her class out of 425 kids, and she's swimming almost every day. It can't be that bad. Go home and think positive thoughts. And, and we totally were about the spiritual thing. I mean, I had every prayer group that I knew praying for her and, and we were definitely wanting as much prayer support as we could get and trying for that. So my point at this venture is that just we had no idea what was going on with Christina. And because she was so high achieving, um, you know, she would push through just basically any amount of discomfort that, to do what needed to be done to succeed. And I'm telling you, this includes she'd come home from like maybe taking the SAT and I'd take her temperature and it would be 103 or 104. But this child would come home from a swim meet and have 102, 103 fever, but she would have told me she was fine. This, so this is, it was her fault for not being open and honest with us about how bad really she was feeling, or badly. Uh, okay, so, um, so, and so also, my point here is not knowing why she was experiencing all the pain and discomfort was, was by far worse than any diagnosis would have been. And I thought Kaylee's last slide was really interesting and I could relate to most of those things that she had up there. I remember a particular day after an appointment, we're getting in the car again for at all children's. And I looked over at her and she was real quiet and I just saw a little tear trickle down her face. And she said, mom, I wish they'd just tell me I have the worst kind of brain cancer on the planet. And it, she said it so meekly, or anything. So at least I'd know that there's either hope or there isn't hope. I maybe could get better. Maybe there's something they can use to treat me besides Miralax and Omeprazole, which she'd taken on and off for years. It was a, That was a rough mom moment, I can tell you. Uh, so it was in January of 2014, a friend told me about POTS, just having heard me talk about Christina's symptoms, the lying down and standing up. So the next morning, we waited, you know, until she'd been sleeping all night, and she was, we took her pulse, lying down, 68, standing, we waited five minutes, 121. That's a difference of 53 beats per minute, just from lying down to standing up. So at this point, we're so shocked and obviously knew, A, this isn't normal, and it fits the criteria for this thing called POTS, which I had just heard of the day before, so knew nothing about, and no doctor had ever said anything to me about it, up to this point. So, and I just put down this list, I literally took it right off of my phone. This is how far away from figuring out what was going on with Christina we were. 
I mean, we had no idea. Did she have pancreatitis? She'd already been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome because basically everyone is that has any kind of gastro problems and they can't figure it out. Was it thyroid? Uh, should she be on dicyclamine, dicyclamine for her acute IBS syndrome symptoms? <coughs> this poor concentration stuff, like this is new for Christina. She can't sit through, you know, and, and like read like she used to be able to. Just, we're all over the map at this point. And after telling them all of this, they looked at me and said, she should go back on the Miralax and Omeprazole. And so I said, uh, well, this, you know, really seems like we need, is there any kind of specialist we can see for this? I said, well, I guess you could see a cardiologist. And I said, so I found a cardiologist at All Children's that specialized in, or that didn't specialize, that knew what POTS was. And they also had us see a dietitian who put her on something called the FODMAP diet, which is about the most difficult diet to do in the world. And I'm preparing things made out of like, I don't know, tapioca, whatever, and organic <coughs> oat, this or that. At any rate, we did this for months and months. That had never helped, not even one bit. Um, and I said, okay, she's supposed to leave for college. I'm gonna insist you at least do a colonoscopy. The doctor said, oh, she just needs to think positive thoughts about her health. There's nothing wrong with her. She just needs to think positively. She doesn't need a colonoscopy. I said, well, you know, she's leaving for college. Let's just do one anyway. So they did. And the doctor walked into the room, sat down and said, I can't believe it. She has ulcerative colitis. Wow, okay, so now we have a diagnosis. And she had also been recently diagnosed with gastroparesis. So I go to tell Christina in the waiting room, there she is. She was so relieved, she, you could have heard her through the whole area, I mean, in the recovery room. She screamed and, and cried tears of joy. She's getting diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, crying tears of joy, because she had some kind of diagnosis that someone had heard of. Because no one knew what POTS was. You have POTS, what, what's that? And now we did, I didn't even know the word dysautonomia at this point. I didn't know the word dysautonomia until after she died. So, so great, we have this diagnosis, and now she's like, okay, they're gonna give me medicine, I'm gonna get better, all these other symptoms are gonna go away, this is gonna be fabulous. Obviously, you know, throughout all these months, her dad and I, but especially I, had a lot of concern about her leaving for MIT, and um, yeah, so that was an issue. So at this point though, you know, my little peanut, she just keeps saying, Mom, I'm going to get better. I have a diagnosis. I'm definitely going to MIT. I am not deferring. I refuse to defer. And her digestive symptoms improved slightly for a couple of weeks, but not enough that she gained any weight back. This is just an example of her weight change over the period of a year. You can see it's kind of self-explanatory. So finally, in late July, she was tested and diagnosed with dysautonomia by a pediatric cardiologist. Um, so I guess I had her dysautonomia, but he just said POTS. At any rate, I, I didn't know how to pronounce it, that's for sure. So, so I told the card cardiologist, I'm like, okay, but what about the weight loss? The days where she can barely move, all these other symptoms, the numbness, the tingling, the ringing in her ears, and the doctor said, you know what, her case is mild. She's gonna grow out of it. You know, she's still swimming every day. She was valedictorian. She'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And I said, well, if this was your child, would you send them off to college like this? And they're like, he's like, oh, yes. And because of her condition, we had to have a cardiologist sign off on her NCAA paperwork to swim for MIT as a collegiate athlete. He's like, no problem. Signed it and said, she'll be fine. It's great that she's swimming. And that's how we left it with him. We left it with the gastro doc. I'll see you on your next break. I think if you think healthy thoughts, you will be healthy. That was her final thing she said to us. And this is to a kid who's so driven and who they're not, no one at this point is validating that this child is sick. You know, oh, you have ulcerative colitis, but we're medicating you now and you're going to be fine. No one is validating anything about how very sick she was. So, uh, let's see. And, and the other thing that the cardiologist didn't do that was disconcerting to me was 
at, or is in retrospect, was offer the possibility, like if symptoms did get worse, like here's what could happen. You know, like if you have diabetes, you know, they tell you this could happen and then you need to do this. Or if this happens, you need to do this. If you get sick, I mean, she was never even told she should lie down flat when she started having, or when she started getting shortness of breath or, or lightheaded, nothing. So, uh, and, and again, you know, he didn't do it because he didn't like us or was trying to withhold information. He just didn't know. He didn't have the information himself. So we were hoping the worst was behind her and I, my husband and our one-year-old son and I went for three weeks up to Bach, to Cambridge, um, literally rented a place for three weeks. I made sure medical, MIT Medical was set up with all her records. She got set up with a specialist and a doctor there that I had to give a pamphlet on POTS to so they would understand what it was. Again, you know, so a lot of this, obviously, if I'd known what I now know, we would have been set up with real specialists in Boston, which there are, and in fact, there's an autonomic lab right down the street from MIT at Harvard, but we didn't find out about that until about a week after she died. And I, evidently no one at MIT knew it either, but they do now. Um, so I got her all set up, you know, with her medications and food and everything she needed. We stayed for three weeks, and um, obviously we're hoping for the best. Uh, so I would get periodic calls from her, but I did get a desperate call home in mid-October, and she said, Mom, I just can't do it. I've, I've got to come home this weekend. And so she flew home that weekend, and she told us that she wasn't able to swim with the team. She had to swim in a warmer pool because of her circulation issues and her weight issues at that point. Um, so she wasn't even able to practice with the team. It was clear she was going to have to stop swimming. And, um, but she had this great idea that she would try diving because uh, she had been a gymnast. So sure, she'll just try diving. So <laughs> this is just what she did. This is Christina. So, so we're like, okay, but I mean, we really don't want you to do this. But to her, this was, these were things that would take her mind off of being sick. So she would go and it would be something else to focus up on other than feeling sick all the time. So, and you can see, I mean, the pictures aren't great, but the first one, the first, the ones in black are literally a week and a half after she just started diving. And then the next one's a couple of months later. Um, it, her symptoms did ease up a bit. Uh, we had her go on a less restrictive diet. In other words, we said, just eat what you want at this point because nothing's helping. And she had a lifting of symptoms from mid-October through mid-December, which was a blessing because she got to really love well, she already loved MIT, but she, she, would, she once texted me home, Mom, any, I feel sorry for anyone who doesn't go to MIT. This place is fabulous. She absolutely loved it. And for that, I'm happy. Um, she also did great on her finals, and, and her grades were really good. And so she understood that she belonged there. It wasn't just a mistake that she'd gotten into MIT. But that leads to uh, her downward spiral. Now, uh, explaining what happened between early to mid-January and mid-February would take probably about 45 minutes, and we don't have that. So I'm just going to just say that she, on about the 18th of January, with 102.5 fever, did complete the 12 dives, four new ones, and did the front two-and-a-half somersault on the three-meter and qualified for the NCAA uh, yeah, the regional, whatever, the next level of meet that you go to, and had somehow gone from never diving before to being the number one female diver for MIT and qualifying for this big regional meet. And then within five days of that, she sends me the post, the text, I think my body has finally given up on me, or has kind of given up on me. Ha ha, I'll keep you posted as I try to move around today, but I didn't hear from her. So long story short, you know, I tried to get up there several times. I had flights canceled. That's when Boston was having those huge storms. So it was like a combination of like all the perfect <coughs> storms, uh, literally and figuratively. She got an upper respiratory infection. 
all of MIT was closed, the campus. She could go to MIT emergency, but they weren't able to see her records to see what meds she should and shouldn't be taking. She got put on an antibiotic that didn't work. And she kept telling me she was getting better. And so I would plan a trip and then she'd say, I think I'm getting better. But I did have two flights canceled because of weather. Long story short, I got there on the 16th. I planned to just spend a couple days there. And on the 17th, she finally broke down and told me how horribly sick she'd been and explained what the last six months had really been like. Uh, I ended up staying for nine days. And just a couple of the things she explained was she had gone from lover, loving these computer programming classes she was taking to literally, she said she'd sit in the corner where she used to sit with like all her friends. She'd sit in a corner, put her hands like this, and she still couldn't leave, when she would leave the class, she couldn't remember one word the professor had said. But she loved the class up until then. Um, so then she was, from that point on, she was regularly running fevers in excess of 104. She just carried her thermometer with her. She would like try to get to classes. She was sleeping 16 hours a day. Um, but there was just like a lot of limited access to any of the doctors she had seen previously because of MIT Medical being shut down so many times. And she did admit that she should have been in a hospital, but she, I think, was the only thing I can figure out is she must have been so delirious she didn't even know to call 911. She was just trying to hang on and survive to get through the next few hours. So that's a real abbreviated version of that month. So we ended up doing the medical withdrawal from MIT, and of course they were fabulous, and we will be so excited to have you come back in the fall, and um, you know, you've done great here, and giving her all kinds of positive feedback. We went back and went to the various doctors to make sure that her sinus infection was in fact cleared up. You know, we wanted to check in with everyone, but the real thing we were doing was finding actual specialists, like looking at Mayo, looking at Johns Hopkins, didn't know about Vanderbilt at that point, didn't know about Dr. Grubb at that point, but just trying to find, we were willing to fly her anywhere, all over, whatever we needed to do. And the plan was on Friday the 6th of March, we would review the findings and share them with Christina and go over a strategy, and that was the day that she and I, I was gonna take her to the pool and let her just lie in the pool, feel the lack of her, feel the buoyancy, and uh, she jumped to her death on Thursday, March 5th, with no hope that she'd ever get better or that we'd be able to find out what was going on with her body. So here's the 17-year-old seven, the kid that every single person that knew her said was an absolute fighter. Said she'd conquer anything, and she could. And she totally lost hope. And I've had a big handful of people tell me since she died, out of everyone they've ever met in their entire life, Christina is literally the last person they would ever expect to end their life by choice. This was just, it wasn't in her. It wasn't, it, she wasn't a, that, she just was not a, she was a person that would fight through things regardless of what was going on. Which brings me to the topic of suicide, which I have been asked to talk about today. So I'm not going through this list, but um, I don't know if I mentioned that I'm a mental health counselor also. So that's what I do like for a job. And so I, do, I know a fair bit about <laughs> suicidal ideation, um, but I just took, went to a bunch of sources and just listed a bunch of signs and danger signs of, of suicidal ideation. The only thing Christina had at all was the exposure to suicidal behavior because of MIT students having committed suicide and then feeling hopeless or in an unbearable pain. But it says talking about, she didn't talk about feeling hopeless. And here I am, for once I've got hope because I'm like, okay, she's so sick, the doctors will actually believe us now. And she, at this point, she's like um, having bloody stools like regularly. There's all kinds of things going on. So I'm thinking they're finally gonna believe us. So to me, it was a complete shock when she ended her life. But the thing, the, I guess the point that I'm trying to make with this is that, um, Silence wasn't the answer. Her side, her being quiet about it and her being stoic, that wasn't the answer, and neither was suicide. So in cases of chronic pain and difficult to diagnose and treat syndromes, where the patient may look fine but not feel fine, 
communication from the patient and then validation by the medical community is what is important. She'd been get, she, she gave up after so many dismissals by the medical community. I mean, we didn't even get to any Dr. Renfro that would actually even try to figure anything out. I mean, we never even got that. So she gave up and I, I still to this day am shocked by it. And what I want you to know about it is I can't really speak to you about um, certain aspects of suicide um, because hers is a very unusual case as is every suicide, I'm sure. But what I can speak to is the effects that it has on the people left behind. Um, you see three, she, she made uh, printed pictures for about 20 people and wrote on the backs of them. Um, I've included the ones to her brother and the one to me. Um, her older brother won't even talk about it to this day. It's been over a year. Uh, he's not doing well. And for me, it's been traumatic. It was life altering. The way the brain responds, and a lot of you probably know this way better than I do, um, following a sudden or unexpected death is basically it goes into shock and survival mode. So for many months, I had symptoms of PTSD surrounding the shock I received at 1.30 a.m. when the police came to my house, two police and two detectives, to tell me that my daughter <clears throat> had died. Um, I think I've gotten through the PTSD piece, but I continue to struggle with memory loss and brain fog, uh, just resulting from that trauma. And I mean, I can even feel it up here. I don't speak with the kind of ease that I did a year and a month ago. Um, so you, so that's, and then the top picture you could probably see that was taken on the day that she was announced as valedictorian on Pi Day, her favorite day of the year. And her funeral was literally one day, one year later to the day on Pi Day. And I really feel like by staying active, Christina thought she was doing what she could to distract herself from her symptoms, but they caught up with her. And, um, and I've really, I, I've never been angry with her about it. I've never, uh, I never went through, I'm sad she's gone, but I've never been angry, and I do remain just proud of who she was and kind of humbled by the fact that I was allowed to be her mom because she was really amazing. Um, I'm proud of the lessons she taught people while she was alive and the lessons she continues to teach in her death. Um, and what I really want is for others to have the hope that she didn't have through competent doctors who are able to describe what's going on with the body and offer some kind of treatment plan, but just who can recognize it. So I jotted down, or I started to jot down a couple of things I would have done differently, and then I thought, you know, there's no point in going into that because I would have done everything differently had I known, had she been diagnosed. If she'd been diagnosed a year earlier, if she'd been diagnosed four years earlier, three months earlier, it would have all been different. So basically what I'm doing at this point is I'm trying to continue Christina's fight that she can't do, but she is doing through me, by working with dysautonomia groups to spread awareness through fundraisers, educational events, and responding to those who reach out to me in need of suggestions and encouragement, which I get many a week um, on either Facebook or email. It really has been humbling to have so many people from around the world reach out to me after hearing about Christina's story and vow to make sure awareness increases. There's a man in Australia who read her story and was inspired by it and was subsequently asked to speak at the Australian Heart Association annual meeting in front of thousands of medical professionals and bring credence to this. And um, there's another woman using it as her Miss, Mrs. America platform. There's a couple, uh, a brother and sister who are doing something called Pedal for Pots where they're going across the United States right now to increase awareness and there's just using this ripple effect I think we and that's all of us and all of them um, seem to be reaching many people but it won't be enough until every doctor every pediatrician every ER doc and every generalist is familiar with what dysautonomia and POTS are and the forms of it and some of the other things that can sometimes go along with it. 
So, and as far as what Kaylee said about like the number of people with dysautonomias compared to Parkinson's, I mean, if you think about the amount of research funding that goes towards something like Parkinson and the lack of research funding for something like dysautonomia, it's really staggering. Um, so basically, her, Christina's story illustrates why this research and awareness about dysautonomia are so important. And thank you for caring enough to be here today. Please share what you learned today with professionals you know in the medical field, and maybe help it, use it to help yourself. Um, if you are struggling or with someone you know, if someone you know is struggling with unusual symptoms or disorders, to be a little bit more understanding. I know there's answers on the horizon, and I know people that are suffering, that are undiagnosed, underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, or diagnosed, like Kaylee, will be helped. But more than anything, I want to thank my sweet peanut Christina, whose example of courage and strength gets me through every day. Thank you.